All right. Thanks, Logan, for joining today. I'm really excited to get your testimony on, you know, recorded and, and documented, man. It's been a it's been fun working with you. I don't know, uh, off and on, I think for the past six months, maybe eight months or so. But your your story and your data has been really powerful. So wanted to share that with other people that, you know, might be in the same situation as you. Um, I know. Uh, well, first, tell us a little bit about, you know, where you're at, what company you work with and, and what's your role over there. Yes, yeah, so I'm the vice president of sales at uh, Elm Street Technology. Um, so I, I run all the inside sales functions for all the all the business units under the category. The, the main main sales team that I run is a sales team of, of about um, uh, 45 reps here in Austin, Texas. Uh, and they support a product called Outbound Engine. And Outbound Engine was a company that existed but was acquired by Elm Street Technology as one of the leading providers in in real estate. Um, real estate tech to help support the the real estate agent in the in the real estate industry so it's a it's a marketing uh program that automates a lot of what real estate agents need to do to to maintain relationships with their entire database and and drive relationships with every single person that they that they speak with so um it's a, it's a highly outbound uh cold call dependent environment so uh we could probably get a little bit more into that but that's that's what i do Absolutely, man. And I know, you know, a lot of people, when they think about targeting certain segments, they say, hey, you know, my connect rate's not that bad. And I think that was the the situation with you all, right? You had a, like a 20 or 22% cold connect rate, if you will, right? Um, what challenges or frustrations were you really looking to solve when you, you know, reached out to phone rated leads? Well, uh, good, good isn't always uh, good enough in my world. Uh, <laughs> actually, what it was a really specific challenge, you know, when um, Elm Street acquired Outbound Engine, we had a, a pretty substantial sales and data operations team that helped support uh, a lot of the data quality that would come into the reps. So, you know, that would include, you know, making sure that the types of data we were calling into are yielding results. And we actually were pretty consistent at over a 30% connect rate. So obviously when, when uh, acquisitions happen, you know, some things, you know, people move on to new roles and, and really that, that team was just depleted and we had a huge gap of institutional knowledge and we were trying to figure out, you know, we've, you know, our, our, our top of the funnel conversion metrics have dropped so significantly, you know, what, what, what can we go do to, to figure that out? Obviously on the table is go hire and build out a data operations team, but, you know, being at the company for so long, I saw the beginning stages all the way to when we were best in class. And that took five years, six years to really develop um, the, the industry knowledge to be able to, to do that job effectively and, and produce results uh, that were in line with what we really needed to, to um, survive on a really a high volume cold call, right. uh, cold call method. So, right. you know, we looked at a, at a few options, rebuilding the team. Um, we've looked at uh, uh, phone companies that may, like directly connect you with the decision maker. So your theoretic idea is, is you know, your, your reps are always on the phone with the DM. Um, the rebuild would take too long and we needed, you know, results right away. We piloted with some of these phone companies that would direct connect. In fact, they weren't even achieving the same type of connect rates or efficiencies that we were doing on our own because, you know, we got, we got a bunch of animals out there. They are not afraid to pick up the phone. So we were overachieving that. And uh, I, I think I got connected simultaneously, somebody internally at Elm Street Technology. And then one of my sales managers had, had seen, I think, a post by Ryan on LinkedIn. And he was like, yeah, just check, you know, check this out. And I was like, well, I've heard it twice. Let me go see it. Uh, and uh, and right, right when I, I talked to you guys for the first time, I was like, yeah, I mean, for me at least, and you know, I'm not the only stakeholder of the business, it was like a mathematical answer to that question, right? We've got pretty good connect rates, but we're suffering top of the funnel. You know, just that, that gap, that uh, gap in variance between uh, connect rate that also bleeds into, you know, bad data rates and stuff like that um, was costing us tens of thousands of MRR every single month. So I was really excited when I met you guys. And I think I immediately was like, how big can this thing get and how fast? Um, but we we piloted with you guys originally, and and yeah, it was a, it was a nice proof of concept really really early on, and and I immediately wanted to pursue that uh, pursue that relationship. Yeah, absolutely. And my next question, I mean, you, you pretty much covered it, but solutions you considered. So you were you know the team kind of got scrambled up, 
it took out five to six years. I love that you pointed that out, right? Five to six years to really build that engine of that thing to, to the, you know, the strength that it was at with the, the production that it was at, right? But I think a lot of people think, oh, outbound is supposed to be this immediate thing that that starts working, you know, and then we add these technologies or these tools and it's like the silver bullet. It, it solves everything, right? But it really takes time to get there. You had tried dialers, you had tried like, I mean, tons and tons of things. What experience were you having with, uh, you know, the, the direct connect, you know, to DM dialers? Um, what, what was the lapse in that process? You said it, it was actually lower than your, your normal connect rate. Can you explain that a little bit? Well, a, a lot. It was very confu- It was very confusing to us. So the initial results in our first pilot uh, were, you know, we can we took reps, a bunch of different reps, really unsophisticated, high high dialers. We took a little bit more sophisticated dialers, and some of our even top reps uh, to see what experience they would have, because you know rep experience is is very very important in our world. Uh, and you know the one I was I was most uh, uh, interested in is the unsophisticated rep. If a rep's going to go out there and knock out a ton of dials, can this system theoretically get them on the phone with more decision makers throughout the day? Uh, our initial go is it didn't somehow. And we started trying to peel back the onion and figure out, well, why, why wasn't that, why wasn't that happening? Um, and it was, you know, our, our first analysis was um, connect rate was lower. Uh, one of the, I think the original company was Throughout all of these attempts that we were making, we were only connecting with 11% of wow. our uh, of, of decision makers, right? So that's a really high gap to make up when we're hitting 22 and 23% with right. just how fast it's going. It's still super difficult. Yeah. Uh, so we were like, yeah, 11% connect rate is not going to get it done. Um, and and so I think at that point we were doing like multiple attempts like at one time, and we we're like, well, we really don't need multiple attempts. Our our data is pretty good because uh, what they were telling us is you know, a lot of the decision makers we were connecting with, there wasn't an available rep to pass that, uh, pass it to, right? So we slowed it down and I took three unsophisticated dialers uh, that that can really put out some output, hit some decision makers and see if we can achieve a higher performance from them. One, we stuck with three, uh, the same way to make sure we we were going to run into any hitches. We reduced, uh, excuse me, three, meaning three simultaneous dials for this person. We took one down to two. Uh, for the next person. And then we took one down to one. If you're just dialing for us, you know, what's going to happen? Uh, what was very strange is it came back and we really didn't see a very large increase in connect rate, which was the next challenge. Nobody could answer our question on why. There was a real black box and in, in what those metrics, uh, where those metrics came from. And for me, I mean, we've worked together for a long time. You know, I'm maniacal. Like the numbers have to make sense. And yes. for me, like triple dials, double dials and single dials were hitting relatively the same connect rate. There's got to be something that's breaking and there was no answer. So we knew that wasn't a a logical partner. We couldn't move forward with somebody like that because we need the answers. If something's breaking, we can't just depend on a vendor to tell us we have to have the intelligence to, to go and make adjustments and fiddle with the machine and make sure that we're getting the output that we need. So we disqualified that one after, after a pretty substantial test, I talked about two pieces of it, but we did a hundred, you know, a hundred different use cases over, over the course of a month. And, and it really wasn't the right fit for us. And, and it, it, it was a, that was a uh, punch to the gut. Cause like when I first heard that idea, I mean, I was like, I was just as excited as you guys, I'd never had experience with that. I'm like, oh man, the world where a rep comes in, hits the go button and it's just decision maker, <laughs> decision maker, decision maker. I was like, what more can you ask for? Well, yeah, I guess you can ask for that. When yeah. our reps can actually do better, just manually uh, uh, clicking next in their uh, in their dialer software themselves. So wow, so that, that wasn't an answer that that checked the box for us. That's really cool, and yeah, I mean, I think that's why you know our relationship has always been so so strong and so solid is because you are so in tune with your data. You know your top of metric, I mean your top of funnel metrics from end to end, and like you said, it's, it's pretty simple for you to look at and say, okay, if I insert a dollar, what do I get back out of it? Right. And you've always tracked that when you were um, using these dialers, these other systems, did you notice they were eating more data? Were you consuming more data without getting more results or what do you have uh, any, any insight into that? That's a, that's a really good point. I I forgot this because I, uh, I brought up this concept with data burn uh, with, uh, with this company. And they're like, what is data burn? And I'm like, this can't be the first time you've heard this. You know, there is a finite number, no matter what industry you work with, you have a total addressable market, right? 
you can't call those people every single day, especially when they say no. So one of my immediate uh, responses, well, yeah, what, you know, is there a world that we burn down the data and we walk in and we have a sales organization and no real prospects to call? <laughs> and uh, um, we, I, I modeled it out and it was like, I think we got to a point where we could have a portion of the floor on this, but it, it was like a nine month drawdown period where like our best data, the stuff that we really wanted to concentrate on would, would essentially fizzle out if we had our whole floor on it. So we, we couldn't even we couldn't even have the entire floor on the same piece of software without the fear that one day we'd walk in and it's like every prospect that answers us on a phone either knows our phone number already and is ignoring it uh, or they, or they answer and they don't give us a very, uh, what I would call a suboptimal response because <laughs> yeah. we had just talked to them the week before and probably yeah. were in their, uh, you know, in their missed calls about six or seven times over the past month. Yeah, that's awesome. So results and benefits of the phone ready leads model. Again, you ran a test some time back. There was a lot of internal, you know, organizational shifts with the acquisition going on. Y'all took a break, you had the data, and then you came back and, and really, you know, did another big test to prove it out. What were some of the results and benefits you saw from just using the phone ready leads model? Yeah, well, we had the initial test with you guys. Uh, and, and I mean, any, yeah, I, I would recommend anybody to go down that route because there, there really is no, if you can, if you can mathematically prove it out, uh, there, there's going to be a benefit there. It's, it's not rocket science. It's what I love. It's like, it's such a simple efficiency improvement that you can address. But yeah, we, we proved the, the concept out. There's actually a couple of things. Yeah, there was some organizational restructuring that we did. It's going to happen in the, in the world of PE back companies. And then uh, for our specific market, you know, I think you guys were really good at multiple attempts. Our data was pretty good and, and we really needed just data validation for a couple of reasons. For a couple of reasons, number one, are we calling the right lead at all? Number two, if it's the right lead, what rep does it go to? So you guys came back with a different model of the single validation test, uh, which re highly reduces your cost. You pass that cost reduction onto us. So I was able to build an even more compelling model. CF, and this is like what I call the CFO model. Because uh, there are benefits outside of just the mathematics. We like to think of that, you know, sales or people are just machines. They really aren't. So there are, there are benefits beyond it that you really can't explain to a CFO because you can't talk about thoughts and feelings. But I was able to make a more compelling model based on the, the price reduction that said, hey, if we put a dollar in, this is how much we're going to get out. And there's no, there, I have no doubt in my mind we'll be able to hit at least these because I know, you know, the emotional impact and the the behavioral impact to a, to a human being out on the floor will actually overperform this hard to model that, but modeled, modeled that for our, uh, for our executive leadership team. And they immediately were like, okay, well, yeah, this is super compelling. I have no idea, frankly, even at the old pricing model, why we didn't advance this. Uh, but yeah, it was just the right timing uh, for you guys to come back to the table. And uh, so we did a, a much larger test that we, was less of a proof of concept and more of a, how much revenue can we really drive out of this thing if we expanded this partnership and the, uh, towards the vision that I, that I had originally. Um, so yeah, we, we, we certainly did pretty good. I'd be happy to get into the metrics. I don't know if you had that teed up in the, in the interview, but. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But before we do the actual metrics, like you, you brought up a really, really good point that a lot of people don't really think about. And that's like the rep experience, right? Like, yes, there's an ROI, right? If, if we were, you know, making X amount of dials and we were talking to X amount of people and now we're making the same X amount of dials, we're talking to Y amount of people, right? Yeah. Like, yes, that's an ROI, but not only that, the, the experience for the rep, right? They can fall into flow. They're not falling asleep at the wheel, like that they know they're going to be talking to people. They're not desperate for a conversation. They're not forcing people into conversations. Like the whole experience for the rep shifts, which I think what you were saying was not only did the dial to connect rate increase, but the actual conversion rate on the conversation increased as a byproduct of those factors. Yeah. Yeah. Ba basically the, the modeling I did was, well, if we can just improve our top, our connect rate, our dial to connect rate by this amount of money and keep, continue the same conversion metrics down funnel, here's the net, net revenue we would drive uh, from a, you know, $1 investment, uh, so to speak. But it, there is a much larger picture here right you know the human beings that are actually picking up the phone right we would love we would love them to be machines but i appreciate that they're they're human beings and I, i've done the job so i always think about sales in the context of well we're asking a human being to do this what impact can it have and uh you pointed out the the largest ones 
you know, it is difficult if you run into one of those times a day where you're just hitting voicemail after voicemail. Beyond that, you know, bad our bad data rates are they're low, but not zero. So one out of 30 calls, one out of 20 calls hits just the, you know, beep, 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 or totally the wrong person. Well, that can throw you uh, throw you out of flow as well. And I think the biggest part of down funnel conversion is exactly right. We saw improvements beyond connect rate because people weren't, you know, I, I can feel like if this bird prospect isn't the perfect prospect, excuse me, isn't a good enough prospect to bring down the funnel, I've got one on deck that I can go after. Now, and a rep's not, you know, calculating all that by themselves. They just have that feeling like I don't need to be desperate with this specific prospect and force them. I'm going to get a suboptimal outcome later on down the funnel. If they're not fitting the criteria of what I need, well, I'm just going to move on and find another prospect that does. And we certainly saw a significant improvement down funnel based on what I would say is more of the behavioral, uh, behavioral and emotional uh, impact as a, a program like Phone Rated Leads. Wow, man, that's powerful. Yeah, love that analysis. I'm glad you brought that up. Now, the metrics themselves, this, this one of this latest batches that we ran, it was a pretty substantial batch. And I think, you know, you're, you're obviously going to dive into this, but it was data that y'all had deemed as unusable or weren't going to move it to the sales floor for whatever reason it was. And you decided to start pulling out and testing these different batches, right? So you were running different lists with different parameters from different sources all at once and then running the metrics on those and feeding those to the floor and then getting the feedback loop in a fraction of the time to inform you on how, what list do I want to continue to move forward with, right? Yeah. And that was one piece of it. And then I think the conversion rates were almost matching the inbound that you had coming in as well. So if you can dive into some of that as well, that'd be awesome. Yeah, it was, it was, uh, um, um, yeah, that, I mean, that's, that's the, the whole analysis that I did. But yeah, to, to talk about the data, you know, we, we have a, a database that we would say is a dressable database of right around 3 million leads. So it's finite. I mean, it's large, but we call through 120,000 leads every single month. So, you know, it's not that large in the grand scheme of things. And then when you reduce it to, well, if I'm going to put forth a cold lead, I want to put forth a cold lead we're going to be productive with. If you reduce the, the addressable lead pool to that specific tranche, it actually reduces to a few hundred thousand leads. So, you know, more people come into the, you know, addressable lead pool that we feel really good about over time based on, you know, marketing interactions or, you know, our data improvement um, that we would do. But then there's this giant, you know, tranche of data that might not fit one or two of these criteria that we can, to a reasonable degree, say, this is the best cold lead that we can put into a pipeline. And I knew there was just gold out there. But again, it's sifting through a lot of the most unpopular activities you're going to have to experience as a rep you know, disconnected numbers, uh, wrong numbers. I'm not getting very many uh, decision maker connects. So, you know, one of the ideas that I had to, to make this a compelling story for our executive leadership team is, well, I'm going to tell them that we're going to, we're going to put data through that we would from never call. We would have never called this data whatsoever. And honestly, it was a backstop for me. If, you know, my modeling, which I'm, I'm good, I, I feel confident. And if my modeling didn't work out, I could still have this like, this back pocket play, this, this card to play that said, well, we would have called any of this data anyway. So all of it's, <laughs> all of it's net revenue. Uh, so it was, it was my, uh, it was my, uh, uh, just save myself. Well, you know, I, you know, I, the modeling worked out, but yeah, I was turning over lists that fit uh, different criteria that I felt really good about. It just missed like one or two of these pieces where we would never cycle the data at all. And those one or two pieces typically lead to the lower connect rates, you know, higher bad data, you know, higher, not qualified. And how'd you guys test that feedback loop came back quick. Um, again, it's not just this is a good enough lead to cycle to the floor with your classification on what happens on the phone. We actually know, you know, you want your best reps on the phone as much as humanly possible. So you can prioritize some for your better reps and filter down to the, you know, people that are ramping up uh, to give them enough data to call through uh, as well. So yeah, the, the initial you know, connect rates were, were obviously in line with, with what we had modeled. Uh, and then, you know, and that was going to be a lot of my analysis, my early analysis. Hey, what if, uh, what is our connect rate? We also do a thing called moved out of new. If we move a lead out of new, what status is it making it into? Uh, because that gives us a good idea of, is the data good? 
our, our, tip, our uh, typical uh, line of success on that is that moving past what we call contacted, meaning is there any interest whatsoever? That could be they're interested, we've set a demo, we ran a demo right there on the phone uh, and the demo closed uh, or, or it didn't close. But those are all very, very successful first dial uh, first dials for us. So our, our initial assessment is, yeah, connect rate's good, perfect. What is our better, what is our better than contacted rate? Well, it's, com it's coming in at some of the other data that we use, email clicks, uh, content downloads. Uh, we port direct inf information over from some of our partners that is really best in class data. We're beating all these better than contacted rates, just getting them on the phone of the decision, decision maker quicker. So I knew really early on, um, number one, what, what, which ones of our, uh, our tranches of leads work best. And, and you know, we, we've looked at it together multiple times. They're all pretty similar. So I was like, heck, let's go find the, the tranche that's converting the best and let's just do a huge, you know, a huge push of that. And that's how we, how we finished out our, uh, our partnership or that, that, that tranche of our partnership. Yeah, so the new connect rate went from 22 to 30 to what was the new connect rate? So we blended it was like it blended it was like 35 percent. Um, yeah. So and I say blended is because we would we would take your phone ready classification and then the next one down where you actually voicemail match, we would push those out to the floor. Uh, now the the ones that you guys matched, excuse me, somebody answered the phone. In some cases, those could be as high as 50%, meaning, you know, we call that person half the time they're going to answer the phone, uh, which was awesome. Obviously, a little bit lower for just a voicemail match. Um, but yeah, we were blended per outperforming what we were, uh, uh, what we were previously doing, trying to pick leads ourselves yeah. uh, without a whole lot of da uh, data, data intelligence on the, on the inside part. Perfect. And then I love the the point that you pointed out on like anything move past contact, right? On our side, we call those completions, right? You, you use some specific term that you use, right? But a lot of people are always focused on the demo and like there's so much more valuable information that's happening, right? Yes is obviously the outcome that everybody seeks, but no is just as important. Like why, right? Not me, who is it, right? Or how, why can't I get a hold of that decision maker that's on that list and not now, when is it, right? Do I need to retarget the list or do I need to wait on timing to open up? So I love that y'all are, you know, um, focus on all the outcomes of the conversation and not just the demo or just the revenue, you know, just to realize revenue. Cause that's, that's really powerful. What were the, um, what were the conversion rates on the, do you have a, do you know offhand the conversion rates from the, the data that you were working to the data that you weren't going to work, but we processed and work. What was the, the, the better than contacted rate, the better than contacted rates on the data we were serving up on data we wouldn't have called versus a cold call that we would select. So minus email clicks, you know, all, all the marketing touch leads, especially minus demo requests, we were double. We were, we were doubling our better than contacted rate, which immediately tells you, well, if we're doubling it, it with an increase in output, you know, we're already looking at, you know, an idea around doubling the revenue we would drive with these versus these if conversion rates pass there stay the same. So the initial few days were, were very, uh, I was very optimistic we were headed down the right, right path. That's awesome, man. Uh, great story. Uh, I love it. Uh, any recommendations for any other sales leaders out there, CFO, CEOs, right? You've had conversations with your entire team about this. Any recommendations for anybody that's out there um, that is considering using phone ready leads? Uh, yeah, I, I may break it up. So as a sales leader, I think I've told you, uh, told this to you guys, as a sales leader, if you have a strong and proven process for selling, this is an absolute no brainer. It's mathematical uh, it, and it will prove out that your sales process works. In fact, I think what I said was the only sales leaders that wouldn't move forward with a program like this is if they truly don't, don't believe that their processes work and they have effective sellers out on the phone. Uh, because yeah, for me, I can offer anecdotal stuff, right? Through an acquisition, you lose a lot of institutional knowledge where I would normally be able to go to our executive team and point out specific, specific metric challenges. Well, the new team comes in and it's just the sales guy complaining about, I don't know, leads and the, they can't sell because of leads. You know, so you start to have the, you know, start to have these, these conversations creep in as, hey, are, are we addressing the market with the right language? Is our sales process correct? You know, for me, I'm looking at all these other tranches of leads. We're, we're still accelerating. We're still continuing to build on conversion rates. And then our cold tranche, which we're are diving off of a cliff 
uh, pretty conclusively when we lost our, our data operations team. And it was personally vindicating to go out and just say, hey, look, this is data we wouldn't even have called. If we just know for a fact, you know, this is a good lead and where it should actually rank, uh, it's going to be fantastic. And the, the conversion rates that we saw, uh, I think you asked this before, but just to point it out explicitly, versus the cold data that we were sending out and the phone ready leads that, that we're seeing, we're seeing a 650% increase in total lead use to converted to deal. So it's driven significant revenue uh, from us and gives us a line to do really creative things with our financial budget this year. So it is, it is a it is a huge, huge thing that, that we've been able to do. So as a sales leader, if you have a proven dependable process that's going to yield results for you, it's, it's mathematical. There's, there's, there's no fail rate for it. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, as like a CFO executive level uh, member, the truest way to know if your product has marketability and you're doing it the right way is get people on the phones with uh, with decision makers. If you can do that, you're going to see pure results that are going to prove out uh, 100 different things. And and to me, if I'm going to make an investment, I'm going to make it in something that's that's highly mathematical and just advancing the top of the funnel that obviously has an impact further down. So that would be my my best advice. I love it, man. I really appreciate your time today. Uh, very, very powerful story and analysis. And um yeah, I'm excited to get this out to other sales leaders out there, other people, and and see if we can create some impact within their organizations as well. Yeah. Um, looking forward to continuing to work together over the I, next few I, months, man. Absolutely. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, no doubt. It was fun, man. And uh, looking forward to it as well. Cheers. Thanks. All right.